Now is a good time to look at this classroom exercise, which is uh, available. Uh, mm -hmm. mm, it seems, uh. So let's uh, look into Frontier and find this exercise. We need to get some practice here, I think. Um. Now, if you look at uh, the solutions here, I put up a solution. Okay, so it's available. But of course, I'll do this on the board as well. So let's uh, have a look at this class exercise for chapter three. We finished chapter three now, so it. Uh, it's okay. I will only look at A, B, and D. Okay, C is not that relevant, so we just drop spending time on that. Okay. So this is uh, uh, an exercise from the textbook, and it says here that Connie has a monthly income of two hundred dollars that she allocates between two goods, meat and potatoes. Suppose meat costs dollar four per pound. And potatoes, uh, $2 per pound, and draw her budget constraint. That's easy, isn't it? We have um, a consumer here. She has $200. That's her income. So I is 200. I drop this dollar sign now. And there is uh, two goods. There is meat and potatoes, isn't it? And uh, the price on meat is given here. It's um, four dollar per pound, and it's the, the cheaper for potatoes, which is kind of as it should be, isn't it? Maybe the difference is a bit small here. So the price on potatoes is given as two. Yeah, this is uh, not very realistic, of course. At least in Norway, the the price on potatoes is. Um, one tenth of the price of meat. Is that the same in your countries? Not in the States? No. Is, is meat cheaper than potatoes? No, but that's closer, right? Okay, oh it's, it's, oh, in Norway it's kind of different. Maybe you have observed already. Uh, if you try to buy meat and potatoes, it's. Uh, potatoes are kind of cheap. Okay, so these are American uh, good numbers then. So that's why all the Americans eat so much meat then. It's relatively cheap compared to potatoes. Okay, good to know. I didn't know. It's a long time since I was in the States. The journey is uh, a plague, isn't it, Eric? Huh? Journey from Norway to the States is too long. It's, it's long. It's so where are you from in the States again? From Michigan? So you have to take a plane to New York first and then over to Zurich or Frankfurt and then to Oslo? Yeah, it's a long journey. Yeah. Like from from China, that's an even longer journey, isn't it? Yeah. How many hours on plane? From where to where? Yeah, from uh, from where you left in China to here. Uh, almost uh, fourteen. Fourteen. Fourteen hours. Forty or fourteen? Fourteen <laughs> or forty? <laughs> this one. Fourteen. This one. That one. 14, yeah. Oh, that's. Forty hours, maybe I was away oh. from the plane. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, you see, we spend a lot of time traveling, even today. Yeah, th this was kind of a sidestep, wasn't it? So the budget constraint is easy to draw, uh, to, to at least uh, write down here, isn't it? It's four times meat if M is amount of meat plus two times potato if th this capital P then is amount of potatoes and that should equal 200 so this is the budget constraint in mathematical form but we are asked to draw it here isn't aren't we yeah so you have to make a drawing again we use our traditional technique don't we so we have to decide on, on what should be on what axis here suppose we have meat here and potatoes there 
In order to draw it, then it's perhaps best to solve it with respect to methane, as we have agreed on. Always solve it with respect to the variable on the second axis. So it's 4m here equals to 200 minus 2p. And we divide by 4 to get m alone on the left hand side. 200 divided by 4 is 50, isn't it? Minus a half p. Okay? Is there a reason meets on the y axis? No. Not here. Here is fully freedom. You can choose whatever you like. There's no logic here. But when it comes to price as quantity, it's normal to have price quantity. That's normal. In this case, there is no reason why meat should be different than potatoes. Okay, so, so here it's more up to you. Okay, so if we put P equal to zero, we get an M of 50. That is one of our points, isn't it? And if we equate this one to zero as a whole, it, uh, we get 50 equals to a half P, don't we? And we end up with P equals to 2 times 50, which is 100, isn't it? So we get another one here, which is twice that one, which is 100. And then we have drawn the budget constraint. What do I get 50 from? That 50? 200 divided by 4. Maybe it was, it was a step in between here. Okay. Yes? You put the P here? Uh, yes. and this both okay? so Yeah, that's okay. Both right? That's both right, yeah. Doesn't matter. It's up to you. Okay. As I said, that doesn't matter. Oh, that kind of thing never matters on the examination, okay? It's the, it's the solution which is important, not whether you do these kind of small things. Now, if we cast a glance at the solution here, now hopefully I can go here. Yes, I can. Then I can go here and see what I did in the solution. Maybe the other way around. Yeah, I did it the other way around in the solution, didn't I? Mm -hmm. As you can see, here the crossing points are 50, 100. There is the other way around, 50, 100. So there I turned it around. Okay, so this should, uh, by all means, tell you that it doesn't matter in on what axis you put this kind of analysis. 4m plus 2p equals 20, 200. That's the same, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Back to the exercise. Suppose also that her utility function is given by the equation uomp equals to 2m plus p. So this is a different utility function. You remember the previous one we looked at was f times c. Okay, so here's the kind of what's referred to as a linear utility function actually. And then the question is, what combination of meat and potatoes should she buy to maximize her utility? So we are asked to solve a utility maximization, maxi maximization problem here with a different utility function than in the previous example. So what happens here? Again, of course, we can do this in two ways, either graphically or mathematically. Okay. Yes, Matt? Um, I'm still on the other one. Um, You're still on the other one. Uh, how come you never took the derivative on this one? What's different about this? One? I haven't made any optimization here yet. I'm just drawing the budget constraint. OK, so you just took the 50 minus 1 half p and set both variables equal to 0 and drew a line? Yeah. Okay. So far, I haven't solved the optimization problem. That comes in B. So what do you suggest? Should we use a graphical method or a mathematical method? Mathematical. mathematical. You would like that. Yeah. Would you like to come and try? <laughs> well, maybe no, I'm just joking. You <laughs> take it easy. I won't put you into this kind of pressure. So you suggest a mathematical way. OK, let's try them. See what's happening, OK? <laughs> let's try to use the method we learned in the previous hour. OK, so now we want to maximize our utility function, which is a function in this case of two variables, m and p. m and p, and it's given to be 2m plus p. 
then we have to add our budget constraint subject to the budget constraint which was 4m plus 2p equals 200 okay and the method I, I devised for you was to solve for one of the variables here input into there and then look at the resulting one variable optimization problem finding the, deri the derivative equating it to zero and solving okay so let's try to do that Have any body of you have any courses in operations research? Mathematical programming? Have you ever heard about the linear programming problem? No. This is a so-called linear programming problem, okay? But uh, that doesn't really matter. It's a special case of an optimization problem, which uh, for the event students, we will return to next year in greater detail, okay? Much more complex. Don't cry, Veronica. There's no reason to cry. This is sheer fun, isn't it? OK. So let me just follow the recipe, don't we? We say, let's put P to that side. So we, we have, or maybe we should put that to that side. Nicer numbers, because then we divide by 2 instead of getting a half. OK? So let's do that. We keep the 2P here, and we move the 4M to the right-hand side. So it looks like this then, doesn't it? And then we can divide by 2 here to get rid of these two to end with p equals to 200 divided by 2. Now I'll write it minus 4 divided by 2 times m. Now I divide it by 2 through 2 on each of these two parts. 200 divided by 2 is 100, isn't it? And 4 divided by 2 is 2. You agree? That should be substituted for P in this equation. Okay, so let's do that. P equals 100 minus 2M is substituted into, and maybe you should put a name on it, equation star. Okay. Then we get 2 times m plus p, and p is now this expression, okay? 100 minus 2m. Okay? So what do we end up with here? 2m minus 2m is 0. Okay, so we end up with 100 here. And we should then equate 100 to 0. Is that possible? That doesn't work, does it? No, that's not possible. 100 is always different from 0. So we're running into a slight problem here. What kind of a problem is this? Do you think? What's really happening here? Have we done some wrong in our computations? No, we have not. So what's happening? Well, don't we only set it equal to zero after we take the derivative? And once we take yeah, the of course. What happens if we take the derivative here? It goes to zero. This is no. That's correct, Matt. U O M. And I said we should do this. But there is no M here, is it? No. So the derivative of this one is zero. Mm -hmm. So zero is always zero. So that doesn't help us, does it? No, at least it's correct, yeah? You're right. We get 0 equals to 0, and that we already knew. Because 0 is always like zero, equal to 0, isn't it? So what's happening here? I think the, the utility function can't be as a direct line. It can't be a straight line? Just uh, the 2m plus p is the utility function. And this, this is you can't have this utility function? You can't have this utility function? Is that what you say? Because uh, the other utility functions and the, the shape of the curve is just like this. 
Yeah, but we had an example here, didn't we, where we had these kind of utility functions, didn't we? If I recall, I seem to recall we had that at one. You remember we had that one, and then we had this one. Perfect substitutes, perfect complements. These kind of indifference curves correspond to that one, don't they? So it's not uh, nothing wrong with this, but we just need to understand optimization, okay? Now it's easy to draw a figure here, I think. Let's draw a figure, okay? Now, this kind of utility function, if we draw indifference curves, there will be straight lines. You can see that, can't you? Now if we take 2m plus p equal to some number, we should set a utility function equal to number to find the indifference curve, let's say 10, then we can solve for p, p is 10 minus 2m, isn't it? This is a straight line in the plane. That means, if you look graphically at it, at it that we have our budget constraint, but we also know that the indifference curves either will look something like this, something like this, or something like this, or any kind of straight line here. <laughs> In this case, the utility as a function of our unknown variable m is 100. It's a constant. So no matter how we make our buying decision, it will not affect our utility. But it's not changed. So we can buy anything we like. We can buy one kilos gram of potatoes and 500 or meat, or vice versa, or any kind of combination. That should mean logically, shouldn't it? That it should look like this. That the utility, the indifference curves are parallel with the budget constraint. In that case, when you try to draw these together, you get an infinite amount of possible solutions here. You agree? So this is what must happen here. You get an infinite amount of solutions to the optimization problem. You could have seen that at this point, couldn't you? Because when you get a constant utility, then of course you can change m to anything you like, and p to anything you like, and it wouldn't affect the utility function, meaning that you must be on this line all the time. As you probably know, there is an infinite amount of numbers on any straight line, given that you allow real numbers to exist. So what other kind of situations could we think of here? Let's look at question D, okay? An outbreak of potato rot. What's that? Uh, do you have any farmers here? Potato rot. It's probably a disease I would expect, which attacks potatoes and makes them hard to eat. I expect that, even though I'm not an expert. I was hoping for some help here. But this, uh, in any case, this potato rot, rot uh, kind of comes up here, and it has the effect of raising the price of potatoes. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? If there's more scarcity on potatoes, the price should rise. In this case, it doubles, actually. It moves from two and up to four per pound. So now the prices on meat and potatoes are the same. The supermarket market ends its promotion. Yeah, that's C. We don't need to care about that. What does your budget constraint look like now? Of course, we get a change now, don't we? Because the original 2 here on potatoes is changed to 4. So the answer to the question is straightforward. In the new budget constraint is 4m plus 4p equals to 200. Of course. It could be that if this Connie is growing potatoes, something could have happened here as well, couldn't it? But we don't know that, okay? So we assume she's not growing potatoes. She's uh, doing something else, okay? So, of course, if she grows a substitute or an alternative to potatoes, rice, for instance, she could get more money, but we don't know that either, okay? But in general, of course, economic relations are linked, okay? So you must be careful when you make these arguments. But uh, this is the answer to the first part of question D, 
And then there's the final part, what combination of meat and potatoes maximizes your utility. If you know some math, you probably see already here that these lines and these lines are parallel. If you take this part here and put two in front of a parenthesis, you it could be written like this, couldn't it? Which is exactly the same as that. So that's the reason why they are parallel in the B case. But no, they are not parallel anymore because we suddenly have a 4 here. So it's not the parallel situation between the utility function and the budget constraints. And then, of course, the question is what will happen here? Actually, it's straightforward. It turns out, in this case, that the budget constraint goes like this. No, sorry, the indifference curve goes like this. And of course, then we can put it into here. And we see that we get a solution at the corner point here, down there. So given this, what was on the first axis, maybe in the solution I did it the other way around. So either you buy all you can or meat or all you can of potatoes, okay? Probably it's uh, meat, don't you think so? As the price went up on potatoes, that seems reasonable. Let's have a look at uh, the solution here. Maybe we find an answer there. This was the first one. And B, you see I did this here and then I got 100, which was what we got on the board. Hence, Connor's utility maximization problem is reduced to maximizing a constant equals to 100. This means that if we make different choices of M and P, no effect is obtained on her utility. That implies that Connie could buy any combination of meat and potatoes, providing 100 in utility. Hence, any point on the budget constraint in figure 1 is a valid solution to her utility maximization problem. Yes, Matt? If you did the new one, is it still with respect to the old? No. Uh, it doesn't say what to do with the subject in D. You think about uh, sub question D. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happens here is that we change this one into 4m plus 4p. Mm -hmm. So of course then we have to look at this new problem with a different partial constraint. Uh, but my argument was that. If this one is parallel with the first one, this one is not parallel. <coughs> I'm just asking if you keep the other part, the 2m plus p, in the sentence above it. What, this one? Yeah. yeah. This one is kept. You keep it the same. Yeah. The utility function is kept all the way through the exercise. We only keep changing the budget constraint here. OK. And, and then, of course, I make an argument here. The reason for this is simply that all indifference curves for Connie are parallel with her budget constraint, as indicated in figure t two. So here's the budget constraint, and here I've drawn some indifference curves. Maybe if I should have drawn them on top, but it doesn't really matter, because they're kind of just always ending up hitting this one perfectly. And what happens in the final? D question, now the potato price is doubled, yielding the following new budget constraint, 4m plus 4p equals 200, as we discussed on the board. As the utility function is unchanged, Matt, it doesn't change, the previous parallelism is altered. And the situation can now be viewed as in figure 3. Let's have a look at figure 3. Yeah, there's the budget constraint in blue, and the utility of 100 exactly hits this one. So we consume 50 or something. It doesn't really say what, what we are consuming. That could serve as a good uh, exercise for you until next time to so actually find out uh, what, we, what we actually consume here. It seems to be meat, doesn't it? Now, if you look at the consequence of these new budget constraint, then we do the same kind of transformation as we've done before, we enter it into m, and then we end up with m plus 50. That is now our utility function. We want to make that as big as possible. Of course, we, should we obtain that by making m as big as possible, don't we? That's the way to maximize a function which only has a single variable in it. 
we can put this as far up as we can. And of course, our budget constraint constrains that as far as possible. So it should be, it should be b b b 50. M star is 50, and P star is 0 in that case. Which was our intuition as well, wasn't it? We started saying that is we should expect that we buy more meat now, and actually we buy as much meat as we can. That's what happen happens in, in the D case. So you see, we run into some problems when there are linear utility functions. They kind of tend to be either parallel with our budget constraint or kind of not parallel. And if they're not parallel, there is actually only two options here, isn't it? Either we get something which hits this corner, or we get something which hits this corner, or we get something which is exactly parallel. That's the three possibilities we have here, given our assumption. So either we buy all we can or one of the product, or we buy all we can or the other product, or we can do any combination we like. It doesn't matter. That's kind of the, the full analysis of this example. If you're interested in looking at question C, it's kind of more tricky because then you start saying, okay, it could be that we have a certain deal and we can get some discounts on our budget constraint. Of course, that has the effect that this budget constraint could go maybe something like this. Okay, we get something for free in between here. And then, of course, it gets more tricky because in that case, you can actually end up with this solution, although not that solution but that solution and that solution again. So you get another possible extra solution. And if there's more breaking points here, you can get a lot of possible solutions. Yes, Kelly? Uh, so the idea of budget uh, constraint is to be precise on what the customer wants. Yeah, yeah. That it is. Of course, you need to be that, don't you? If you have 100 crowns in your pocket and you're walking around the street and if you can't borrow any money, that's what you have. So the idea is to try to look at this trade-off between two goods, okay? It, in a sense, of course, it's silly, because you don't trade off between two goods. You trade off between hundreds of thousands or millions of goods all the time. But uh, again, as I said, that becomes tricky to handle. So that's the reason why we're going to look at just two goods to get a situation where we can draw these diagrams and all these kind of stuff, okay? But in principle, of course, uh, in reality, we trade off between far more than two goods. Okay. Questions? I see no reaction here. That means I'm moving on. Then we move to chapter four. Okay. Next notes. Chapter 4, open it. Let's see, yes, there we are. Mm. I'll just go and wash my hands, okay? The essential parts of the first part of microeconomics takes place in chapter four, okay? Because now we kind of see what we use, uh, attempt to use this for to derive the demand curve. That's kind of the, the main objective, and that is what is discussed in chapter four. <coughs> it says here something about the individual demand curve. So we're still at the individual level, we're still at the single consumer. And now we're aiming at deriving the individual demand curve. It says here, the individual demand curve is found by repeatedly changing the price on one good, keeping preferences, the price on other goods, as well as income constant, 
registering optimal consumer choice of the good Q and accompanying price P. So now we use our toolbox of utility maximization to look at what happens now if we change the price on one of the goods. That's the idea. Okay. And it's at the bottom it says this table of values QP is the individual demand curve. That's what we're looking for, isn't it? The demand curve is a curve or a relation or a function between quantity and price. Perhaps it's not so easy to see at this level, but hopefully it improves when we, when we move along here. Here is a graphical example on the meaning of the previous slide. Okay, let's start at the top here. Now, the idea is that we utilize what we learned previously. We learned that if we change the price on one of the goods, this budget constraint, if increasing, the price is moving in that direction, isn't it? So we can uh, think that we decrease the price here. And then, of course, this original curve swings out, swings out, swings out, swings out, as many times as we like, okay? Depending on our choice of how many times we change the prices. In this case, there's been two price changes. Okay, we start from a certain point, then we change the price, maybe moving in that direction with a decreased price, moving there with an even more decreased price. And of course for each of these different prices we can do our argument of using indifference curves, drawing them, a lot of them, and find the one which actually hits the target here, which is a, tang a tangent, that produces an A point in our first experiment. That A point produces a certain value for, our for the consumer's food consumption, as well as a certain value for clothing. We are really not interested in clothing now, we are only interested in food. Okay. So we have a certain point here. We can observe that we consume four units of food, and of course we can re register the price we have at that point. PF, okay? That is actually two dollars dollars in the food. We don't see the price of food here, do we? But we have that on the side. That makes our budget constraint. So there is a direct correspondence with this utility maximization point A here, and another point here, which we call E. In that E point, the consumption of food is four, and the price is something we already have. Okay? It's the starting point. The starting price of two dollars. Then we might make a price change. The price is uh, increased, it seem now, seem, seems now, into. Mm, mm, it's decreased from $2 down to $1, isn't it? You see that next point EG has a lower price. As I said, we are moving in that direction. So, Moving from that budget constraint to that budget constraint involves a price change from $2 originally down to $1 at the next point. Of course, then we can repeat our utility maximization, draw new indifference curves, end up at a new optimal point. In that case, it turns out to be 12, which is the consumption of food. This seems reasonable, doesn't it? We have half the price. Of course, you should expect there is more food to be bought, as opposed to clothing, if that is kept constant. So then we have a new point G here, which consists of uh, two observations, a price of one dollar and a consumption of food of twelve. And of course the story goes on, we move to this point, in that case we are lowering the price even further down from one dollar to fifty, so we do a kind of halving each time, and in that case Again, repeating our utility maximization, we end up with a new solution, which in this case means consumption of 20 units of food at a, an accompanying price of 0.50. And these three points here are three of the points on the demand curve, okay, because they prescribe a link between consumption of a certain good and price of the same good. That's what we're aiming for.
So you see, this is the normal way of explaining the, the, the derivation or the uh, how to kind of construct a demand curve without doing it straightforward mathematically. You think you're doing a mental experiment in your head. Assume we have this situation and we do a utility maximization on a certain budget constraint. Then we find a solution. We know the price here. Then let's change the price, repeat the process, we get another point. Change the price, repeat the process, we get a third point, and we keep on like that. So we can fit in as many points as we like on this thing that turns out to be a curve in the end. Okay, there's kind of just our patient that stops us doing this. But you see, we need this utility maximization. We need the budget constraint. This is kind of the underlying tools. Then we can do this very relatively simple argument to, to argue that there should be this kind of curve. But there is a but here. Now we're looking at a single consumer, aren't we? And the market is typically not a single consumer. A market could be hundreds of thousands of consumers, okay? So let's assume we look at this slightly differently and assume there are two customers here. They are both in this situation, they have this information, they see the prices. But there is only a single producer. Somebody will have to produce this food, okay? Somebody will have to, let's assume there's one of those, okay? There are two consumers. My question is, can we then do the same argument? We can't, can we? Can we? Because if there are two consumers, they could they could kind of stick their heads together and say we don't like this price. They can try to force this producer. Can they say, oh, you want to sell us food here at the price of two dollars? We don't accept that. We will only pay you a quarter of a dollar. And of course, given that their force position is good enough, they can end up with that, couldn't they? So you see, there is some underlying here related to what we started about talking in this course, related to the need of an infinite amount of consumers. In that case, they can't join this coalition that could kind of kill the existence of this demand curve. Okay, so this is a very important point. It's not very clear in the textbook because, because this is basically the crucial point. Okay, the, what's the kind of gaming situation that could occur here when there is more than one consumer? Because in the textbook, you say, okay, if there's two or three, we do something very simple. But uh, unfortunately, it's, it's really not that simple. But for the moment, you can kind of think that these kind of effects are not there. Okay, that's kind of how you have to think in order to accept this way of argument in order to derive a single consumer demand curve. And that's what we end up with here. But as I said, if there are more, if there is not a single moving to an infinite amount, there is some kind of finite amount in between here, either on the producer or on the, or on the consumer hand, it it's really not that easy. Uh, we could actually question the shared existence of a demand curve in those situations. And of course then all this theory breaks down. Okay, Then we can't look at intersections between demand and supply. Okay, It still do it really doesn't work. So uh, be, be, be aware of this thing. Okay. okay, we can do this mathematically. Of course we can. Let's have a look at that. This is the typical thing in microeconomics. You can either do it graphically or mathematically. Okay. So let me see if I'm able to explain to you how this can be done in this case. Because now we're doing something different, aren't we? Okay. We keep our example. We have these two variable utility function which has f and c as arguments and it's given as the product of f and c and we have our budget constraint f plus 2c equals 80. Now recall what we did previously we just solved this with respect to any of the variables entered the result into the correct variable 
got a single variable problem, took the derivative, equated it to zero and solved. Okay. <coughs> As you can see here, that's done straightforwardly here. We substitute our f with 80 minus 2c, that part multiplied by c, that c, that produces 80c minus 2c squared. We take the derivative, which is 80 minus 4c, equated to zero, and so for a c star equals to 84th or 20. We did that previously, didn't we? In order to do this in the demand curve shape, we need to have the price as a function here, don't we? It must kind of we are varying the price, aren't we? In our previous example, the thing we did here was to change the price. So we need a variable for the price when we want to do this straightforward mathematically without uh, hanging to this uh, graphical measure. So let's uh, look how it can be done. The only thing that changes is then equation two. So instead of having this one, we have to enter the price which are interesting as a variable or as a parameter here. So this one changes into F plus PC, which is the price on clothing, which is what we're looking for the demand curve for, times C equals 80. This one is not changing, this one is changing. And the, the clue here is to submit a given price with a variable price. Then we can continue exactly as before. No magic here, okay? We do the same as previously. We solve for F as 80 minus PC times C, straightforwardly from there to there, and then we take this expression and submit it back for F in the utility function. Then we get a utility function or a single variable C with a parameter PC in it. That's the idea here. So we end up with uh, 80 minus PC times C, which should be multiplied by C. Then we have replicated this one. We calculate together like this. Then we take derivative, which is 80 minus, sorry, 2PCC, isn't it? Then we equate that to zero, and we solve for C. What time is it? Okay, let me finish this. So 80 equals 2PCC, and we have to get rid of this one, so we get end up with an optimal amount of consumed clothes as 80 over 2PC, or 40 over PC if you like to making it easier. And this is exactly the individual demand curve we will arrive at if you do it in this way. Relatively simple, okay? We just introduce this parameter PC so that you can solve, in a sense, a repeated set of optimization problems. That's what we do here by entering this parameter. So this is the demand curve for clothes in a straightforward mathematical form given by our initial utility function as well as prices on both goods and these income. Yeah, that, this wasn't so hard, was it? And I didn't hear it. Who was, should I move? But recall what I said previously. The assumption of kind of atomistic consumers, as you said, they can't cooperate is kind of underlying here, okay? If they can cooperate, then things become tricky. <coughs> of course, at this point, we only just look at the single consumer. And of course, we kind of assume that he can't make an alliance with another consumer trying to force down the price. Which, of course, typically would happen given a kind of very simple economy with a sing simple single producer and two consumers, they would kind of make an alliance trying to force the producer. Of course, the producer could force back. But we really don't know what, what will happen here, do we? 
Not as in this case, where we know what will happen. We know so much in this case, we are actually able to derive a link between how much the consumer will buy as a function of the price of the given good. So this is a demand curve. For a single consumer who is kind of either single or uh, together with an infinite amount of other consumers. I think that's the correct way to, to say it. Okay. Then there is a break again. Break, break yeah. It went so fast. Yeah. This was interesting, huh? <laughs>